Father, we do thank you that uh, you offer us your, your grace, your acceptance, your love, your, your mercy, and uh, it's really our decision. You give us a free will to decide whether to choose forgiveness or not, choose to bow our knee to, to you, to your lordship or not. Lord, but uh, how wonderful the hope of heaven that we have in our hearts as we look at uh, a picture of eternity and what, it, what it's like at least as it begins. But um, the shocking contrast for those that uh, reject your love and refuse your, your forgiveness and what awaits them as well. How sobering, Lord. So uh, use it to stir our hearts to pray for those that don't know you. At the same time, may we rejoice in the hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're nearing the end of the book. And one of the things that we've kind of at least uh, spoken about on occasion is the fact that um, uh, the book of Revelation, unlike, uh, say, an epistle, doesn't really tell us how to live the Christian life, uh, but it does tell us what awaits us at the end of the Christian life. And that's meant to be a blessing, certainly. And it's also meant to be a difference uh, maker in terms of our, our perspective on life and uh, and especially during, I think, times of difficulties and uh, in hardships. Uh, if, uh, there's, a, there's a certain segment of uh, what we call American gospel music that actually came out of the slavery uh, era uh, in this country when African Americans were brought and in, put into slavery. And of course, there were many Christians working very hard initially to try to free them uh, from that uh, horrific scene. Uh, and in the process, many of them came to faith in Jesus Christ. And if you look at the music from that era, <clears throat> it's all about heaven. Every, every song they sang, pretty much every time they got together, you know, swing low, sweet chariot, coming to take me home. Uh, because life was so horrible, everything was focused on, on heaven. Uh, but heaven certainly should uh, mean a lot more to us than, than just in the difficult times. Although in those times, maybe it's uh, even more, more precious but uh, I certainly has a way of getting us to focus on the things that are important in life. I, um, uh, again, knowing the outcome at the end should change how we, we live this life. I, uh, um, Lane, uh, well, during the playoffs are going on, and uh, he said that uh, we had had some meetings and done some things about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday. He says, but I, I recorded the games, so if you want to watch the games, you can come on up to my house. Of course, uh, Lane and Grace live in uh, Crouching Line. It's not a hop, skip, and a jump, and uh, if you're on the mainland, it is, uh, but, uh, but once you live there for uh, a while, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a bit of a trek up there. Uh, he happened to mention, though, that, Lane had, uh, that Grace had been cooking all day and kind of named the menu, you know, homemade salsa, chicken enchiladas, chili rianos, and I thought, you know, that football sounded really good to me, you know, so I, th I think I can bypass my nap for the afternoon and try to, try to squeeze it in. And uh, so we followed him up there. Uh, now, what I didn't plan on uh, was the fact that I'd get a call from, uh, from Josh, and I had my little Bluetooth in or uh, my uh, earplug in. So I took the call, and he was uh, TDY and Maxwell like five hours ahead of us. So these games are history as far as he was concerned, and, and uh, couldn't help but talk about those games and what the scores were. <laughs> Which was okay, and uh, and uh, so we talked a, a, a good chunk of the drive uh, going out there. So uh, what it did though is once once I got there, uh, you know, I could focus on the important things like chili rianos and chicken, you know, you know those things that are really important as opposed to a mere football game. And even watching the football game, it took all the anxiety out of it. Somebody missed a field goal, it's okay. I know how this thing ends. Oh, dropped a pass, it doesn't bother me because I know how this thing ends. And uh, I even, uh, I even I, the plate of, I know it's getting here in lunch, the, my plate of food with the guacamole in the middle was so great looking, I even took a picture of it, uh, <laughs> sent it off to Josh, he knew I was on my way up there, he texted me back real, real quick, I don't know how they do that, they text back like in seconds, I, I can't do that, it takes me like several minutes to punch my way through, in seconds, I, I had a message back that says, that's worth the drive, <laughs> and, and it was. But, uh, but again, if we know the outcome, Jesus Christ returns to planet Earth. Uh, we're with him in terms of the rapture, uh, however long of a period before the tribulation, we don't know. Seven years of tribulation, a thousand year, of, year reign of his messianic kingdom. Uh, and as we kind of concluded last week, we're kind of moving on into eternity. 
uh, and knowing what eternity will be like with the Lord should impact what worries us and what doesn't worry us and what we're really focused on and what we hold uh, dear, near, and important to us, I think, in this, uh, in this life. So let's take a, take a look at um, uh, verse 11 to 15, again, chapter 20. There's an absolute judgment for those who reject his love. Fortunately, we're going to move on to the contrast of those who have accepted his love. But uh, this is for those that reject the love of Jesus Christ. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Several things that are certainly important about this. The absolute judgment comes from the one who sits on, on the white throne. The throne's mentioned 45 times in the book of Revelation, only another 16 times in the entire uh, New Testament. I think it's white because of who's sitting on it. It's Jesus Christ representing his purity and righteousness and holiness. Uh, I think it's great, not because of the size, but because of, of um, the magnitude of what takes place uh, before this, uh, this throne. And, um, and again, the one who sits on it is none other, other than Jesus Christ. We see that in John 5, 22, uh, there. Jesus says, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And uh, uh, again, as a believer, when we're raptured to be with the Lord, or uh, if uh, we just happen to step in front of the bus or whatever it might be, and we're absent from the body and present with Christ, forgive me all bus drivers, I don't know why we always use that as an illustration, but uh, nonetheless, when we stand before the Lord at some point in time, uh, very interesting, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be judged according to our works. The unbeliever, same thing, at the end, at the end, at this point, will stand before Jesus Christ and be judged according to his works. Two different things, two different places. Again, as believers, we stand before Jesus Christ, the beam of seat of Christ, where, again, that is the word used for the judgment stand in the Olympics when the awards are handed out. When we watched the Olympics uh, recently, uh, and uh, at the uh, end of those events, uh, in the evening, they would have a ceremony, and you would have three athletes standing on the beam of seat, and they would be getting their award. And uh, so you and I, according to Jesus, in many parables, such as the parable of the talents, based on how we use our time, talent, and treasure for his kingdom, will be rewarded uh, for that in, in the, the next life. At the same time, unbelievers, at the end of this period of time, of that thousand-year messianic kingdom, will be brought before this great white throne, and they will stand before not the Bema seat, but the great white throne judgment. White because of its righteousness uh, in terms of the judgment of Jesus, uh, and great because of the magnitude of what happens there. And again, it's Jesus that is sitting there. Notice a pretty dramatic statement that heaven and earth will flee away. Uh, the person that stands at this point before Jesus in this great white throne, it's like, you know, like one of those movie scenes where it's just like heaven and earth are there and all of a sudden, they're, they're gone. And the only thing is Jesus on that throne in this person. It all, it's all gone. Uh, there's nothing else that exists in a sense or matters at that moment before they stand before uh, the throne. John also in uh, his gospel adds another little insight that's kind of interesting in John 5, 27. Speaking of this uh, situation, he says, uh, and has given him, Jesus, authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. The father won't execute any judgment. Very interesting. Jesus will do it all. Uh, and he, one of the reasons that he is doing it is because he's the son of man. Nobody standing before the great white throne judgment will be able to say to Jesus, you don't understand. You don't know. You don't know what I lived through. You don't know what I experienced. You don't know the kind of 
they won't be able to do that because he is the son of man. He came, took on human flesh, lived the perfect sinless life. Now the writer of Hebrews, uh, the other side of the coin says, he's our great high priest and the perfect high priest because he's able to sympathize completely with our condition. But at the same time, he is the perfect judge as well uh, because he is the son of, son of man. Uh, the second thing about this absolute judgment is for the dead, small and great. In terms of who they are, well, they're, they're everybody, all walks of life. It doesn't matter what someone did in this life. If they uh, flipped uh, uh, hamburgers at McDonald's or they were the president uh, of Bank of uh, America, it doesn't matter, small and great. It doesn't matter their education, their, uh, their economic status, where they're from, how it's just... Did they accept Jesus Christ or not? Everyone who did not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and, and the acceptance of his grace will stand before the white throne. Notice where the dead come from. Uh, that uh, uh, death will give up the bodies and Hades, uh, the realm of the spirit, will give up uh, their, their spirits. Uh, again, there's two terms sometimes generically used when we say or we use the word hell. You have Hades, which is a temporary place of abode. We see that from Jesus' teaching in, uh, in Luke 16. When a person dies today, apart from Jesus Christ, they go to Hades, which is a place of torment, but they are waiting for the great white throne judgment when they are sentenced. And once they are sentenced, uh, then they are cast into Gehenna, which is the, uh, the lake of fire that John uses the term twice, the second death. And every time he does it, he puts a definite article in front of death and one in front of second, the second, the death. And to emphasize, this is the most horrible thing that you can uh, even imagine trying to draw his, our attention to it, even in the way he writes it out uh, in, in a Greek text. Uh, the absolute judgment is notice it's based on books that are, that are open. Um, and again, uh, scrolls or, or books that are there, and Jesus is looking at those. It's the record of each person's life. Uh, he considers it in order to determine the degree of punishment that they will suffer in hell. God is a just judge. He's not going to punish Hitler the same way he does somebody who's a wonderful moral person, but just never, never accepted Jesus Christ and his love or forgiveness. Uh, the record of each person's life is examined, and there are degrees in hell. We see that in a, in a couple of places. In Matthew 11, there it says uh, in verse 20, uh, Jesus talking about uh, cities where he lived and ministered and the opportunities that people had, saw the miracles, heard him teach, saw the fulfilled prophecy, comparison to some other cities that were judged by God in the Old Testament. He says, then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, you are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Some are judged more severely. Others are judged less severely based on the information they had, the opportunities that were presented uh, before them. In Luke 12, Jesus says this in verse 47, talking about uh, uh, servants and, uh, and a master in terms of a parable. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with a few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. Some beaten with many stripes, others with few. So Jesus is at the great white throne judgment. People will, will stand individually before him uh, who have never accepted the Lord. And uh, all heaven and earth will flee away. And books or scrolls will be opened. And then accounting of their life. And that accounting of their life 
is a determination of where they will spend in, in hell. So apparently there are some places that are a lot deeper uh, than, uh, than others. He mentions the book of life. The fact that people's names are not contained in the book of life, they are the ones that will be for the great white throne. Uh, and then lastly, the absolute judgment. Absolute judgment requires the, the lake of fire. And um, uh, again, this is, uh, I think it's a subject that we probably uh, neglect in terms of the church because uh, who, who wants to talk about this, you know? But at the same time, I think it's something that we need to talk about because Jesus did on many occasions and taught, taught about it uh, several times. Matthew 18, um, Matthew 23, Matthew 25, Mark 9, uh, other passages where Jesus talks specifically about hell. Uh, and again, there is Hades, Hebrew is Sheol, a temporary place of torment, and then there is this Gehenna or the, the lake of fire where people will will be cast into. Now, we've already found that at the end uh, of the tribulation, the false prophet uh, and uh, the, Antich the Antichrist, the beast, are both cast into the lake of fire. At the end of the tribulation, then Satan is cast in the lake of fire. And we know from another passage, that's who it was intended for, as well as the fallen angels. Uh, but uh, God allows men and women to have a free will choice and he will not force anyone to go to heaven. You must choose whether you want to go to heaven or not, whether you want to have your sins forgiven or not. But again, to not choose is a decision. You, you have to choose to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Jesus, came in, when he came to this world, said, I've not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world from its sins, because everybody already stood condemned. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God. We're born into sin. We're born with a sin nature. Uh, and uh, it's just a question of that's, that's the condition we're in. Will we choose to, to come out of that condition and offer the free grace uh, that Jesus offers us by his death on the cross? Of hell, Jesus says, there the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Uh, it's a place where people are tormented for all eternity. Uh, and, and some people say, I think it's just symbolic language, cast into outer darkness, fire and brimstone. Well, if, if that's the case, that's not good news. Because uh, in the English language, uh, again, a, in the Greek, a symbolic term is always represented of something of a greater degree. In other words, if, if it's described as a lake of fire, the reality is it's much worse than that. That's the symbol we're using to just try to describe it. So people try to say this is symbolic language and somehow dismiss it. Uh, that doesn't help any. That, that actually paints the picture uh, even much worse. Uh, why is there hell? Well, one writer says, hell is a witness to the righteous character of God because he must judge sin. Uh, hell is also a witness to man's responsibility because God could have, but he did not create us as little robots down here or helpless victims, uh, but a creature that has uh, the ability to make choices. Hell is also a witness to the awfulness of sin. And uh, once we see as God sees, we'll understand how horrible sin really is. I think as part of uh, growing our relationship with the Lord and closer to the Lord, uh, sin begins to be more and more an affront to us. Uh, all the time, maybe things that didn't bother us as young Christians, as, we, as we're, if we're growing closer in our relationship with the Lord, uh, there's, just, there's just more things in our life that we wish weren't there, and we wish God would change and, uh, and purify us and, and work uh, in our own hearts, and, and we can only imagine what it is from God's perspective, and so there is hell. It is a reality. It's for those that reject his love. And a person must reject it in order to end up there. Well, let's move on. For those who, uh, secondly, who accept his love, all things will be made new. And, uh, and as we move on, just again, I think that I like the, uh, 
uh, the William Booth quote, the founder of the Foundation Army, who said that uh, what he wished he could do with all those that he discipled and trained for the ministry, he wished that he could dangle them over the fires of hell for three days and three nights and then pull them back and then send them out to preach the gospel. You think they'd be a lot more effective uh, in reaching the lost. And, and I, I think that's the point here why even this is a blessing. If we understand the reality, it should make a difference on, again, if we know the outcome, it should help us focus on the things that are really important, like chicken enchiladas and so forth, but uh, that to follow the analogy, really important stuff. Let's go on. For those who accept his love, all things will be made new, verses 1 to 5. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. So those who uh, accept his love will see a new heaven and a new earth and uh, the old creation, everything passes away. Jesus in Matthew 19 refers this as uh, the regeneration of the, uh, of the earth. And, uh, uh, and again, it's all, it's all going to change. 2 Peter 3.13, Peter says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the idea of heaven means a lot more to us sometimes when we're going through a very, very difficult uh, time. So I just, we were, uh, you know, doing the, having our prayer meeting with the guys yesterday morning, and we were kind of wrapping it up. Uh, someone mentioned one of the guys that uh, was uh, really sick earlier uh, in, the, in the week and had a high fever and, and uh, made reference to that he was ready <laughs> to, to go there. <laughs> and sometimes that's the way life, uh, life is. Uh, and it does, it does help us to know that uh, for the believer in Jesus Christ, this is the worst it's ever going to get. <laughs> for the unbeliever, this is as good as it's ever going to get. It's, uh, it's quite a contrast. Jesus said this in a uh, uh, classic verse, John 14, 1, in terms of what heaven should mean to us in difficult times. He says, not, not, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you, you may be also. So again, we're, we're, we're all in a need of a change, and we all have a longing. It's very interesting, the, one of the big films that's out right now is, uh, is Avatar. I haven't seen it, just seen some clips from it, but uh, I've, I've read a lot of stuff from uh, people uh, online that have watched it, and, uh, and they, uh, for some pe people, it's actually created some psychological problems, because they, uh, it, it, and it's a story of this beautiful planet and, and, and so forth, and people want to go there. They want to live in their, there's people that have seen this thing five and six times, you know, and uh, uh, there's, because there's a longing in man's heart for something more than this. In fact, it was uh, that point that led C.S. Lewis to commit his life to Jesus Christ because he came to the conclusion that nothing in this life could ever fully satisfy. Therefore, we must be made for someplace and something else. And that was one of the things that in his uh, uh, wonderful intellectual mind began his search to try to understand God and what it is to have a relationship with, uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, we need a change. And our physical environment here is going to pass away, the first heaven and the first, uh, first earth. Now, uh, Peter mentions the idea of global warming quite some time ago in 2 Peter 3.10. There he says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in them will be burned up. At the end of that millennial kingdom, as we go into eternity, everything we know, even as good as it was with Jesus Christ ruling Satan, bound and so forth, uh, still, you know, no, 
the curse removed in terms of no cataclysmic events and storms and weather problems and so forth, perfect environment, even that is not good enough for us for all eternity and all of that will be, will be consumed. Now, no more sea doesn't mean no more water, but uh, three-fourths of the globe consist of water. Uh, so I guess we needed some additional real estate, so they're gonna, uh, it'll be a little different there. Of course, this led to uh, several discussions, some of the guys around the coffee pot, and the concern for the lack of surf in eternity. So I just mentioned uh, uh, you got a thousand years and the millennium, just, you know, get it out of your system, you know, or, but uh, I'm sure we'll be surfing the universes, so... Uh, it'll be uh, surfing the North Shore will be pale in, uh, in comparison, but uh, very different uh, environment, a new heaven, new earth. Uh, those that accept will see, his, uh, see the new Jerusalem, and John characterizes it as a, as a holy city, uh, maybe in contrast to uh, the Jerusalem that is here now and uh, in Revelation 11.8 referred to as Sodom and Egypt where they crucified our Lord and Savior. But it'll be a holy city, also a beautiful city. Notice how it's compared is uh, the beauty of a bride on her uh, wedding day. And uh, uh, that's kind of one of the, uh, there's, there's lots of things that are, uh, that are fun, uh, you know, that as far as what I get to do as a, uh, as a pastor. I got an email from one of the guys, uh, Brian Yamaji, this week, and uh, he said they were doing some war game stuff, and he said he got to jump in the back of an F-16 uh, for, for a while there during the war games and how great that was. And I, I uh, emailed him back because I'm pretty sure you're getting paid for that too, you know. And I said, but uh, I still have the best job. And uh, we'll probably carry on that conversation for a while. But uh, one of the things that's great is doing the, the weddings. And uh, I remember being uh, actually so nervous or concerned about doing the very first wedding I did that uh, I'd actually did it with Pastor Bill. And he told me, he says, now the thing to keep in mind is that we're going to walk up front, all these people are going to be there, uh, and um, there'll be a little stirring and everything, but once that music begins to play, uh, and everyone stands and turns to look at the bride, then you can relax, because no one will pay any attention to you after that. <laughs> just pretty much say those words, and you'll just kind of roll through, because every eye will be on her. And, uh, and sure enough, that's, that is absolutely uh, uh, true. And uh, sometimes I say that to the, to the grooms before, uh, uh, before the wedding. As we're standing there and they're a little nervous, I say, hey, relax. No one's going to pay any attention to you. I don't want to hurt your feelings. But uh, every eye is going to be on, on your beautiful bride. In fact, that's all you're going to be thinking about as well. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's the case. Uh, and that's the picture or the metaphor that John uses to somehow describe uh, and introduce the idea of the New Jerusalem. Now, in the rest of chapter 21, he's going to go on and give us some more uh, details, and we'll look at that next week. But a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, those accepted will experience a new emphasis in their relationship with God. I don't know if you notice that or not, but God the Father will dwell with, with mankind. Uh, interesting record of, of God's relationship with man, walking with man in the in the garden, in the Garden of Eden, before uh, the fall. Uh, after the fall and that separation comes, then, then finally we have God dwelling in the tabernacle and later the temple in terms of the Shekinah, what we refer to as the Shekinah glory of God, that cloud uh, by day and the fire by night. Uh, and then later you have the incarnation of Jesus Christ now dwelling uh, with man, and then you have the the death and the ascension of Jesus Christ to heaven, and then you have the Holy Spirit, and now God dwells uh, in us in these uh, earthen uh, temples compared to jars of clay. Uh, and then one day in this time in eternity, the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and God the Father will come and dwell with us. It'll be a uh, it'll be a different kind of a relationship. Uh, however, however it, it is, during, during the Messianic kingdom, it seems to change, in, in a sense, e even as we go into uh, all eternity. Uh, notice also, those that are accepted in his love are experience a new dynamic in daily living. No more, uh, no more bad memories. No devastating experiences. No more... Uh, you're not worthy because we remember when this happened. You did this. Uh, the concerns of, of the sins of the past, small and, and great, 
uh, will be remembered uh, no more. I think that's going to be but that and not having a sin nature, I think, is going to be heaven right there. Uh, I, I think it'll just be tremendous. But Isaiah, 2,700 years ago, <clears throat> mentions this in Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. So the eternal city is so wonderful uh, that the only way that John can describe it is with the words, no more, no more. No more pain, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more death. That's, that's the city that he's describing. Those accepted will receive the promises of God. Notice verse 5, then he sat on the throne and said, behold, I make all things new. And then goes on and refers to himself as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, a designation already given for the Son and now used of the, of the Father here with some other promises. And again, the idea that uh, uh, all the promises of God will be realized uh, in, in this wonderful time of eternity. Uh, we can believe it based on his ability. He spoke the heavens and the earth uh, into being based on the accuracy of his word. He tells John, these words are true and faithful. And based on his authority to do it, he is the alpha, first letter in the Greek alphabet, the omega, the last uh, letter in the alphabet. Uh, it, he is everything. He is the first in the last word. So there's an absolute judgment. Uh, there are some wonderful things who, are, who have accepted his love. And then thirdly, there's an announcement of blessing and a warning of the second death. Again, tying verse 8 in where we, let, we began in chapter 20. There it says, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murder, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. So an announcement includes blessing, the phrase, to him who thirst. Uh, again, thinks, uh, certainly brings to, to my mind the scene in John 4, the woman at the well, and Jesus uses the same phrase there. And, uh, and you remember, again, Jews had no dealings with Samaritans, but Jesus makes sure he goes to this area in a sense, a divine appointment with, uh, with this woman. And she says to him at one point as he tries to go from from what we say small talk to big talk uh, and introduces the idea of, of water in terms of uh, using it as eternal life because that's our John's point here, same writer, to him who thirsts, I give eternal life is the idea. Uh, in John 4, 11, the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. When then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So again, here the, the reiteration or the promise of, of everlasting life. And who is it for? Those that overcome and uh, that's a phrase that John's used many times. These promises of blessing for those who overcome. But again, in his epistle, he's already told us the one that overcomes is the one who places his faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, very interesting. After the uh, Chicago fire of 1871, D.L. Moody, uh, the evangelist, uh, returned to his home like many others, and it was burnt to the ground. Uh, a friend came up at that moment and, and uh, expressed some condolences. I'm so sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Moody, that uh, you seem to have lost everything. And uh, he said, oh, no, no, I haven't, uh, I haven't lost uh, everything, you know. And uh, he says, oh, really, I, I, I didn't know, you know, do you have other homes? I mean, I didn't know you were, you know, wealthy or whatever because everybody in that city lost everything. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, no, actually, he, he turns a revelation of course, happened to have a Bible on him. Turn to Revelation 21.7 and read, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God. Uh, yeah, that earthly home had burnt down, but actually most of what he owned was still in heaven. 
that you and I as uh, children of God, as the beloved, as forgiven, have an inheritance waiting for us in, in, in heaven. And uh, notice, and, and he will be my son. Sorry, gals, but it's, it's the idea of status in the family and so forth, that it's for, that it's for every believer is, is the idea. So uh, wonderful. Our relationship is going to be so different with the Lord then that, than it is now. Uh, the inheritance that we have waiting for us. And then the announcement concludes with a, a warning, as, as I mentioned. You have the word but there, contrasting. Uh, and once again, John uh, places, again, a, a definite article in front of death in, in the second, saying don't, don't miss this. The person who continually sins as a habit of life uh, will be rejected uh, because, uh, again, we all need to be forgiven. And that's, that's what gives us hope uh, and, uh, in this world. Chuck Swindoll wrote a, wrote a little something I had read a number of years ago in one of his early pu publications. He says, when life hurts and dreams fade, nothing helps like hope. Without hope, prisoners of war languish uh, and die. Without hope, students get discouraged and drop out. Without hope, athletic teams slump and keep losing. Without hope, fledgling authors run out of determination. Without hope, addicts return to their habits. Married couples decide to divorce. Inventors, artists, entertainers, entrepreneurs, and even preachers lose their creativity without hope. But what gives us hope is forgiveness. It's, it's, not, a, it's not, not, not just a kind word uh, or a helpful thought from somebody that we respect or love. Uh, that's great. You know, Proverbs says, uh, an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. But there's a lot of times in life we need a little more than a little cheering up. Uh, and it's in those times that we can have hope because of what awaits us in the future. Uh, and we have that hope because we are, we are forgiven. I'm going to show you this little, little video clip, maybe bring this uh, to a little bit of reality for us. Well, let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that we have that hope. And we know that, uh, Lord, testimonies like this certainly stir our hearts because they, it hits home. We've all lost those that we, we love. It's even more dramatic when it's unexpected. Lord, but to walk through it with you and the, the comfort that you bring, uh, and it makes all the difference in the world to know that we'll be with them again, that you offer us a, a life of peace and joy internally, not, not always easy circumstantially, but to know that you'll always be here and go through it with us, Lord. And because we're forgiven, we have hope and the hope that uh, keeps our eyes focused on heaven. We pray that we'd have that eternal perspective, Lord, that it would make a, make a difference in how we live each and, each and every day. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.